a good lunch. Um, so I'm Charmel Hudson with Lower Layer Labs, and we have a problem that we have servers, and these are like physical servers in data centers and colos, and these servers have disks. These disks have secrets on them that we really want to remain secret. And these servers run Windows. And I realize this is a Linux event, but running Windows is not the problem that we're dealing with. One of our really big concerns is where do those secrets go when we, say, decommission uh, racks of machines? Um, you know, we're really concerned about what happens if we accidentally uh, chip out a, a rack with, uh, with the disks in it. And this isn't a hypothetical sort of uh, threat. There have been numerous uh, data breaches that have been caused by uh, systems shipped with uh, classified material on them. A study a few years ago found like two-thirds of disks bought on eBay still had personal, personally identifiable information on them. So you might be thinking, this sounds like a job for encryption. And you're right, but that gives us, just turns it into a key management problem that we now have to worry about. So let's do a quick review of the boot process, um, which we have already been through earlier uh, this morning. So when the system boots, the UEFI firmware is read out of the spy flash, and it then typically will load a boot manager, sometimes Grub, uh, sometimes the, uh, the Windows uh, boot manager off the disk. And then that, in turn, will uh, start the Windows NT kernel, uh, which will then want to update Windows on every single boot, from what I can tell. Uh, if you have a BitLocker system, the uh, the, the bootloader is stored in the clear text on the EFI system partition, and it then uses what are called uh, BitLocker protectors to unlock the system volume with the kernel on it. These can be TPM sealed secrets, they can be user pins, and so on. Um, we typically, uh, for our laptop systems that we use with, uh, with Windows and BitLocker, we have both a TPM sealed secret and a user pin. And that might seem redundant, but uh, th there are problems that you run into with the, uh, with the user pen, because we really want these systems to boot unattended. The problem that you run into is that if you do not have the pen, when the system boots, if it is able to uh, receive the, the disk encryption key solely from that uh, TPM sealed secret, it's possible for someone to sniff the TPM bus and uh, read out that BitLocker key. Again, not hypothetical. Uh, Dolo's group uh, had a really good demo of this uh, a little while ago, where they, they were able to extract a BitLocker key from a laptop, boot that in a virtual machine image, use that to then gain access to a corporate VPN, and then pivot to uh, move horizontally inside the corporate network. So one way we can prevent this from being a problem is we only want the machines to boot unattended if they are all on our own network that we control. You might say, ah, BitLocker has a network unlock feature from, uh, from Microsoft. Why don't you just use that? And it has a lot of limitations, uh, one of which is it is built on DHCP. So when the system boots, it sends a non-standard DHCP uh, option that has the TPM endorsement key, and then the server replies with a, uh, with a secret for that that is then combined with the TPM sealed thing. But there's, there's no quotes. There's nothing that tells us anything about the state of the machine, which is a problem for us because we only want the system to boot automatically if everything is in the correct configuration. That we don't want a rogue admin to be able to change the firmware settings to uh, um, say boot without secure boot enabled or something, or to change a platform key. Uh, we also want to be able to detect if like new hardware has been installed in the system that potentially uh, gives a local attacker the ability to, um, uh, to exfiltrate secrets from the machine. So again, you all might be thinking, 
this sounds like a job for re remote attestation with uh, TPM uh, rooted keys. And we actually have that. We built this for our Linux servers. And you can watch my talk at OS, OSFC uh, back in 2020, where, where I presented uh, the safe boot attestation system. Um, it works wonderful for Linux, but what do we do with our legacy systems that still run Windows? So there are a few possibilities, and there are a lot of people have looked at how can we boot, how can we use um, uh, Linux to sort of bootstrap Windows. Um, and again, you know, if we go back to the uh, sort of the boot process, we have the UEFI firmware and SpyFlash. It can fetch a Linux bootloader over uh, Pixie or something, um, which can then query the remote attestation server to get the keys. And uh, you could then hypothetically k exec straight into the NT kernel, um, which, you know, start up Windows. There's a really neat open source project called Quibble that is do, attempting to do exactly this. But it's making use of undocumented APIs that the handoff from the Windows bootloader to the, uh, the NT kernel is not at all documented. That's a Microsoft secret. Uh, it turns out that it's really fragile between versions. So this approach wasn't going to work for us. It's something that we could maintain and operationally deploy. So another idea. Again, have the UEFI flash, load our Linux kernel, do our remote attestation, get the keys, and then maybe it could uh, turn around and just exec the Windows boot manager as an EFI executable, which then could go and start uh, the, the, the Windows kernel. This almost works. Um, it does require some hacking because kexec out of the box only supports um, bzimage and multi-boot. Uh, and there's no EFI boot services available to the Windows bootloader. So this approach, you know, we, we actually made some attempts to try to get this to work. Uh, some people have actually made pretty good progress. But again, it doesn't work as a deployable operational sort of thing. So one more idea. Again, we get our kernel, uh, we do our remote attestation, and then we k-exec the UEFI uh, payload package, which is a special build of the EDK2 um, open source uh, firmware that doesn't actually run on real hardware. It assumes that UEFI has already started up and that memory is initialized and the devices are already initialized. And it just provides just enough boot services for uh, things to be able to run. It can then load the uh, Windows Boot Manager and then in turn load the kernel. Uh, this approach has actually been um, put together by Chris Koch and, uh, uh, and some folks at Google. They have a really good presentation about how it works and uh, what challenges they ran into. The problem is it works wonderfully in QMU, but not on real hardware. Uh, because we don't have the real boot services, we uh, can't talk to the OEM provided device drivers. We can't talk to the real NVRAM. And we don't have the ability to uh, control SMM. Um, and the, uh, the, the UEFI payload package pretends that SMM doesn't exist. So it works in the uh, limited applications that Google needed, but unfortunately wasn't uh, suitable for ours. So what we've come up with is uh, a slightly different idea. So we, we load our, our Linux kernel, do our remote attestation, and then we have a ch program we call chain load that actually returns to the, uh, the UEFI firmware in the ROM um, and then loads the Windows Boot Manager out of a RAM disk, which then can, can start uh, the Windows kernel. This uh, hits all of the, the bullet points that we required that we get all of the OEM drivers. So if you're on real hardware, you can talk to the RAID controller. You can talk to the BMC provided video device. Uh, you can talk to the NVDIMMs or whatever other things you might be booting out of. The NVRAM that you get to modify is the real NVRAM because you're, you're still talking to the real runtime services. The SMM handlers that are installed are the real SMM uh, handlers you know, in locked in SMRAM. The caveat is we can't disturb anything 
uh, out that, that UEFI thinks needs to, um, uh, to be there, that all of the uh, structures that UEFI has created have to uh, stay intact. So hopefully we can now just do a quick demo. This is going to be in QMU, not on real hardware, because the real hardware takes absolutely forever to boot, um, which is a, a big problem that, uh, you know, again, <laughs> time to start up is, is really atrocious on these things. So uh, we drag over a window, run the attestation server, and then we're going to run boot the system in uh, QMU. And uh, it's going to fetch our, uh, our loader over Pixie, because we don't want to have any clear text on the disk at all. Um, and then we get a quick scrolling screen and a bunch of stuff. Uh, it does an attestation, um, which involves getting a, a signed quote about the state of the machine. And then uh, chain loads into Windows 10. And then eventually we get a little spinny thing and uh, Windows starts up. Yay, Windows. <laughs> so let's see if I can actually skip to, okay. So let's go into a little bit more detail about how this works since a lot of you are kernel developers and interested in you know, what, what actually did we have to modify in the kernel to make this work. So the first thing is that we want no clear text on the disk. So we're doing a network boot and we're receiving uh, what is called a unified image. So this is a, uh, a Linux kernel and an NITRD and a command line that are bundled together with a uh, EFI or a PE32 wrapper that is then signed with a key that we're actually putting um, into the platform key for, for our hardware. So this means that uh, if there's an attacker on the network who subverts the Pixie system, they won't be able to boot a, a random kernel there. Um, the wrapper that we're using is very similar to the systemd uh, uh, EFI stub with a few uh, changes. The, the big one is that we, we have to run Check. Okay. Uh, we, we have to run Linux entirely 